Welcome on into the Wolverine.com podcast. Clayton Safey here with Anthony Broom and Chris Ballas on a Thursday as we preview Michigan against Texas. We have a massive show for you today. Make sure to like the video if you're watching on YouTube. Hit that thumbs up button. Hit the subscribe button as well. Get all of our content and head to the Wolverine.com. You can use the promo code GOBLUE for 50% off an annual subscription right now until Friday night at 11.59. So we're running a special for the big game week. Again, promo code GOBLUE at thewolverine.com gets you 50% off an annual subscription. That's $4.99 a month build annually. And uh, again, offer ends on Friday night. So take advantage there. Get on our message board, all of our premium content. Um, But let's preview this game between two blue blood programs. Michigan, the reigning national champions, of course. 1,005 wins, leads college football. Texas tied for fourth with 949 wins. Both teams in the college football playoff last season. Both teams 1-0. Michigan coming off a 30-10 win over Fresno State. Texas dominated Colorado State 52 to nothing Last Saturday, these two colors coming together, burnt orange against maize and blue, should be a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's kind of funny. Everybody's writing Michigan off at this point, and, of course, most of us pick Michigan to lose, including all three of us, but – Everybody's saying, oh, it'd be a shocker if Michigan won this game. It wouldn't be a shocker at all. It would just mean that, uh, you know, Texas has as good a team as we thought they did, and and they do. But this is, uh, this is a good Michigan football team, especially defensively special teams. If they can get the offense to where they want it to be, solid to good, then they can certainly uh, beat Texas at home. So I'm excited for it. Can't believe we're here already, fellas. It seems like summer just started. It seemed like the natty just ended, and we were on the field picking up some – some confetti, but here we are and uh, can't wait for Saturday. Yeah, this is, this is a big game. Uh, maybe, I mean, the biggest game you can play the Michigan, the biggest game that Michigan has played in week two or in the non-conference in a really long time. And it's an exciting matchup. I mean, this is what, you know, I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of people upset or, or bothered by this new era of college football. It's here. And what it's going to give us is more matchups like this, especially, when Michigan gets into its conference schedule. So you got to grow up in a hurry. Uh, if you're going to win this game this weekend, I know you're at home. I know, you know, you feel good about where you have, you know, your matchups you have in a couple areas, but um, this is, this, this one is going to tell us a lot. I think about the trajectory of this team, you know, how ready this coaching staff has them after a week of where you need to clean a lot of stuff up. So I'm excited about it. And, uh, you know, regardless of what people say, it's a coin flip game. I could see this going either way. So um, it's hard to believe it's here. I've been talking about it all off season. And now here we are. The irony of the non-conference schedule the last couple of years too, is that they had really experienced veteran teams coming back, especially last year. And they didn't play anybody early. They were able to kind of ease in. Now, when you have everybody leave uh, understandably after winning the national championship, and I guess also your coaching staff is gone for the most part, uh, part, then you have an extremely tough test in week two. So it's just how it shakes out. It's how Dave Brandon scheduled it back on September 17th, 2014, when this thing was put on the books. It was actually supposed to be in Austin, Texas. Originally, they moved it due to the TV contracts with uh, Texas going to the SEC. So a little more fortunate, I think, in year one at a Sharon Moore with a brand new offense and a bunch of new pieces that they play this one at home. Uh, should be a great, great environment. What would a win for Michigan mean for Sharon Moore uh, in his first big game as Michigan's full-time head coach? Well, it's huge, right? It gives him all the momentum uh, that he would need. To, you know, it, it buys you a little bit of goodwill, number one, because you're going to have the idiot fans coming out. And sure, they were already coming out in the first half of last week's game. Sharon Moore was the wrong guy. I told you you're a moron, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, it was a solid win against a, a good team last week. Of course, the offense struggled a little, a little bit. You have a brand-new offensive line. You get a brand-new center who nobody was expecting to be center who just moved to the position. So there were some communications errors. And, and yeah, he got pushed back on a, on a fourth and short play, whatever. You know, it's going to happen. He's going to get better. And he got better in the second half of that game for the most part. But for Sharon Moore, uh, this would buy him a little bit more goodwill. And everybody's going to continue to say, hey, these are Jim Harbaugh's guys and let's see what he does with his team. And that's not unfair. We saw it with Juwan Howard, right? You know, year three or four is when you can really kind of tell 
what your program is and who you are. And it's, uh, but he's learned from the best and Jim Harbaugh, it's still surreal as Clay says all the time too, that Jim Harbaugh's not here on the sideline. And there was definitely a different feel for it. We all advocated for Sharon Moore and, and I'm glad he's here and I'm glad he's gotten this opportunity. I, I said this, I would feel better about this matchup if it were Jim Harbaugh on the sidelines, just because he's one of the best coaches in the world, fellas, it has nothing to do with Sharon Moore, but to me, He's got an opportunity here to really gain some momentum, some recruiting cred and everything else. And, uh, you know, it to me, if it's if it's a close game and they lose at home, if it's well played, you know, what do you say? You tip your hat. The one thing that you want to avoid is some really ugly game or a game in which you get blown out. I don't anticipate that one happening. So and I do expect this offense to look better in week two. It's huge. You know, a lot of people will kind of point the you know, point the finger back at Michigan who, who sort of, you know, perpetuated the Ryan day born on third base thing and say, Oh, well, Sharon Moore is the ultimate addition of that. You know, he won a couple of big games last year with a team that was Jim Harbaugh's. Um, this is a big game for, you know, the found, you know, laying a foundation for what his time at Michigan is going to look like, especially again. And maybe it feels a little different if they came out last week, and just hammered Fresno State wire to wire, and they emptied the benches, and you're like, all right, well, this looks sustainable. Um, the fact that they have a lot of that they had a lot of coaching to do coming out of that first game, um, there's a big spotlight on him. And you know, if they can find a way to get this done, which I, I certainly think they can, um, you know, don't forget that this is a guy that when the headset was on on a Saturday, when Michigan was playing the you know some of the toughest games on its schedule last year, he outcoached James Franklin. He outcoached Ryan Day, and I think you know if things break the right way, he can outcoach and outfox Steve Sarkeesian as well. So this is a big uh, and uh, this you know whatever happens Saturday isn't necessarily a referendum on the early start to his tenure at Michigan, but it's going to do a lot for the narratives and 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 what this looks like going forward. Because no matter what happens Saturday, two weeks from now you have a USC team that looks very improved compared to last year. So. Um, one game at a time, one week at a time, but this is a major opportunity for him. Yeah, and in the grand scheme of this season, too, it would be a huge resume win for Michigan in the non-conference. It would also give this team a lot of confidence going into the big games, like you mentioned, Anthony, with USC coming in, going to Washington, that sort of thing as they go through the schedule. If you win this one, there's a very realistic path at being undefeated heading into November, getting away in my, ahead of myself, but this is the biggest test until then, until they play Oregon, in my opinion, on November 2nd. So we will see. Let's break down the matchup. But before we do, talk about our friends over at Prize Picks. Do you guys like to have fun? I think you guys do, right? This is the fun. fun is my middle name. <laughs> fun is his middle name, Chris Fun Ballas. And you can have the most fun watching your favorite teams, watching your favorite sports. With prize picks, uh, where you can win up to 100 times your money this football season. You go to prizepicks.com, you go to the prize picks app, you select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. It's super easy, super fun to play. It's a great way to test your skills as a fan. Uh, I make my picks, submit my entry. It takes less than 20 seconds. I just did it earlier today for tonight's NFL opening game between the Chiefs and the Ravens. Put in a couple of picks. I got Travis Kelsey less than six, uh, 60 and a half receiving yards, and Zay Flowers more than 54 and a half receiving yards. Uh, any picks for you guys this week? Yeah, I took Zay Flowers as well uh, with the with the more than, uh, but I took Travis. Uh, I took Kelsey over because I believe that Taylor Swift is going to be in attendance. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And there you have it. And he's going to want to impress his girl, his woman. So uh, yeah, that's why I did that. Completely legitimate relationship, too. I'm very excited for those two kids. Uh, I'm going more than 60 and a half receiving yards uh, just because that that number is jarring to me. Uh, Travis Kelsey is the, the engine that makes that offense run, even with uh, Pat Mahomes. So I will go more than that. And uh, shout out to all the Swifties out there. Boo, boo. Uh, but we do have a special offer for you on – prize picks as well go to prizepicks.com or the prize picks app use the code wolverine to receive a guaranteed 50 dollars once you play five dollars in lineups again go to the prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com use the code wolverine to receive 50 dollars once you play five dollars in lineups uh, sign up today 
get that $50 instantly when you play $5. Uh, you don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed if you use the promo code Wolverine. And they have a special as well this week. If you get uh, more than one Caleb Williams passing yard, that gets you one win on prize picks every week in September. That's right. Only one yard gets you an automatic win every football weekend in September. Four weeks of free W's. Uh, don't miss this deal on prize picks. It's gone when September ends. I am not rooting for Caleb Williams, but that's a pretty low number. I'm rooting for him to get two passing yards as a Lions fan. So uh, the prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Uh, let's start with the Michigan defense going up against the Texas offense. To me, this feels like strength on strength, right? Uh, a lot of weapons on the Texas offense, four out of five returning starters on the offensive line coming back against uh, what we know Michigan has defensively. Quinn Ewers making his 24th career start in this game, very experienced, had a really good season last year, has you know apparently improved coming into this year as you would expect. A whole new cast of characters around him, but they did a good job in the transfer portal with uh, you know some wide receivers. Uh, they're banged up at running back, but uh, Jaden Blue looked pretty good last week in his first career start. What do you guys make of this matchup? It's, it feels like the one everyone's watching. I think they got to make Ewers uncomfortable. I think they have the ability to do that. He doesn't move as well as Mikey Keene, probably. Am I mistaken there? I, I think you're right about that. I think I'm right about that. And if you can get him rattled, and I think that our guys at Texas have said the same thing. He doesn't throw well as well under pressure, but no quarterback does, right? So – if you can stop the running game, make them one-dimensional, and I think Michigan has a good chance to do that with this defensive line. I understand that this is a good Texas offensive line, but if you do that and rely on your guys like Will Johnson in the secondary and an experienced safety crew and don't let the ball get over your head. I'm worried a little bit about the blitzing, right, the, the big plays. Make them earn everything and hold them to field goals. That's been the key for the Michigan defense against the better offenses they've played the last few years. And I would imagine that Wink Martindale has watched the film of those games, and Wink is who he is. He's going to be more aggressive. But don't be do it irresponsibly. I thought they were irresponsible on the third down play last week uh, on third and seven from, I think, the 17-yard line and gave up a touchdown. So no easy ones, guys. And if you do that and you fluster this kid, maybe force a turnover or two, uh, then I think you got a great, great chance to win this football game. So he's a great quarterback. There's no question about it. But – uh, I can't remember the last Ohio State or former Ohio State quarterback to come into Michigan Stadium and win. That's fair. Um, yeah, I look at this matchup, and you know, Sark is kind of a wizard when it comes to you know the motions, misdirections. You know, they're going to do a lot to try and confuse um, or you know test the eyes of the Michigan linebackers, the secondary, all of that. Um, those guys got to be on high alert, and I don't, you know. Quinn Ewers is a veteran enough guy where I think if you bring extra pressure too often, he will find a matchup. Uh, you know, they have, I think it's four transfer wide receivers that fill out there too deep now. And it seemed like based on what, you know, I watched that Colorado state game last night and a little bit this morning, um, you know, they, they have good chemistry already. So again, he's going to find a matchup if you kind of, you know, tempt him to, um, you know, it's really one of those things where strength on strength, I, I think Texas really strong in the trenches. That's the key to all of it. I mean, you need those Michigan defensive tackles to eat up some double teams. You need them to be disruptive and push the pocket back. Um, you know, I think your your edge guys are going to drop back in coverage now and then, and then they're going to have to also rush the pass. You know, there's a multitude of things they're going to be asked to do that I think they're capable of doing because this is kind of, um, you know, an advanced – Michigan defense more. It's, it's kind of the antithesis of what the offense is going into this game. So you got to put those guys in positions to succeed, um, you know, and looking back at the, I'm not going to fixate too much on the cover zero thing from last week. I think, uh, you know, you got to pare down some of that substitution stuff where you have an entire series where your second team guy is out there. I, I don't think that can happen this week because um, they will Sark and, and Ewers will find that matchup. They will, you know, pick on, you know, Miles Pollard, if he's in the game, they'll pick on Jaden McBurrows if he's in the slot. You got to handle your business. And you got to put these guys in position to succeed because I think that defense almost has to kind of pitch a perfect game if this offense is still figuring it out. So you don't want a mistake to be amplified by the fact that maybe you're not super up to, you know, up to date with playing complimentary football just yet. So big test for these guys this week. The game's kind of on the defense in, in a way, at least to keep them 
in it. They can't win it on their own. You have to score some points to win a football game, but it, it's going to be really key that they play well. Like you said, Chris, limit the big plays as well and make sure that you know they can get off the field and you know you hope the offense can do enough to stay on the field, keep them fresh a little bit as well. Um, but openers can be deceiving as well. I know we talked about this a little bit on Monday, and I'm kind of reminded of this as well. Michigan in 2022 plays Colorado State, and they had, what, nine sacks? And everyone was talking about, okay, how are they going to replace Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo? And the pressure was constant on these dudes. And the, but and everyone thought it was fixed right away. But then it was kind of a work in progress, right? They had to kind of figure out exactly what the pass rush was going to look like, who were their best edge rushers. You know, Mike Morris ended up being that guy, and they didn't get as much as they wanted out of the interior all season long. Kind of saw that come to a head a little bit against TCU. They had to blitz a lot. It's one example against this same opponent that they can be a little bit deceiving. Michigan's opener against a better opponent could be deceiving as well. So – the Texas offense did look lights out against Colorado State, but that's not a great team at all, nowhere near what Michigan played. So uh, I do think that Texas still has a big test as well, like coming in here and having to face this Michigan defense with that coordinator, who, by the way, worked with Steve Sarkeesian in 2004 with the Las Vegas Raiders, or it was the Oakland Raiders back then. Those two are going to have some wrinkles for each other, I think, this weekend. It's going to be fun to see that kind of chess match as well. But – uh, one also key for me is just shore up the middle of the field coverage from last week. Michigan gave up quite a bit. Safeties, Brian Jean Mary talked about it this week. The linebackers have to be better. And Sarkeesian will test you there with uh, a lot of play action, RPOs, things like that. And Michigan has to be, uh, you know, shore that up, be a little bit better. Um, let's move to the Michigan offense, which does look like it's kind of a work in progress. I mean, Davis Warren was – named a Michigan starter at some point midweek before the opener, open competition, heading into game week, which doesn't necessarily indicate that you're super far along in terms of maintain or establishing and maintaining an identity. Uh, Texas comes in last year, 116th against the pass. Apparently have, you know, made that a focal point this offseason. They only allowed 74 passing yards to Colorado State. But again, it's Colorado State. Uh, to me, it comes more down to the – Michigan's ability to potentially run the football here, Kalel Mullings, Donovan Edwards, Alex Orgy. If they can get that going, then, you know, I think Michigan's got a, you know, pretty good shot. Yeah. And speaking to people close to the Texas program, they understand they watched Michigan film and they said they showed nothing. It was as vanilla as vanilla gets. And we've said, you know, we've heard the same thing from the Michigan coaches and you know, what do we you expect us to go out there and throw everything first of all, to overwhelm Davis Warren in his first start. And second of all, they've been talking all summer about, being, you know, leaving Texas guessing and, and prepared for both quarterbacks and so on and so forth. And so they didn't want people to know who the starter was right away. And they wanted to show two starters and you still have Texas probably thinking, well, could Alex Orgy come out? You know, it would have been better if he hadn't bounced past that one to the sidelines, you know, can Alex Orgy come out and throw the ball a little bit? So and I think he can throw better than he's shown. So I don't think they're really sure what to expect. I know Michigan's receivers are better than they've shown. Tyler Morris needs to be better. Samaj Morgan needs to step up a little bit. But you know what? Colson Loveland is essentially a wide receiver in this offense. So you're going to see him get a little bit of attention, a little added attention, I would imagine, from Texas. And there are weapons out there, guys. Kalel Mullings is a weapon. We don't, I don't think we saw him throw a pass to the backs, did we, in the last game? If I'm not mistaken, I can't remember. There were any. a couple. Kalel dropped one. Oh, did he? Oh, well, yeah, the little, the little ones over the middle. Yeah, but yeah. I'm talking about – yeah, that's fair. But uh, they're going to put them in positions to succeed. I, have tr I trust Kurt Campbell, right? Now, at the same time, you can only do what your guys are capable of, right? And if Dom Jadice is going to miss some communications or some assignments, and, then it's going to blow up any play, and you're only as good as, as the execution. At the same time, I think he'll be putting them in good position to, to make plays. I, I trust that he's been working – knowing Kirk Campbell the way we do, I trust that he's been working on that game plan all summer for this game, guys. I think the first series or two are going to be critical. Got to move the ball, got to get some points, in my opinion, and get something established here when the plays are scripted. You're on mute, AB. My bad. That's what happens when uh, a <laughs> uh, little background noise here. Um, yeah, I went back and watched that the Colorado State game from last week. Obviously, anytime you beat a team 52 to zero, uh, you have handled your business. But 
you know, watching that Colorado State offense, I think that uh, first off, I think they ran the ball for about, I think it was 125 yards. Their offensive line was getting a little bit of push. And, tech, you know, one of Texas's biggest questions coming into this year was how they replace, you know, Byron Murphy, who I think was the number, you know, top 15 pick or top 20 pick. Devondre Sweat was the guy that went early in the second round. Um, those guys kind of made that defense go last year. Super stout up the middle. Not at all unlike what Michigan has this uh, this year. So uh, I think they're still kind of looking for answers there. Uh, you know, they didn't pop. You know, Colorado State didn't pop any big runs, but, you know, there were a lot of body blows. And, you know, I think it's, it's one of those things where, it, it, you know, if Michigan is able, as we saw late in that game, when you had guys – on assignment and getting a hat on a hat, they're moving the football. And I think this is, you know, for as much as, you know, Donovan Edwards, we're waiting for a big, you know, his first breakout game of this season. Of course, he's had a ton of them in the past. This feels like a Colel Mullings game again, a steady body blow. I think one of the best things they can do for this Michigan defense is go on these long sustained drives, move the ball down the field, the body blows in the run game. And, you know, I kind of think that, you know, the middle of the field, you know, I saw it a lot. There are a lot of opportunities left on the table for Colorado State to kind of attack there. And that's where Colston Loveland comes in. That's where I think Marlon Klein can be a little more of a factor in this game. Michigan wide receivers, I mean, let's call it what it is. Basically no-showed last week. A lot of mistakes left on the field there too. So um, I think a lot of, listen, I mean, Colorado State was a 35 and a half point underdog for a reason. Um but that game is maybe just even slightly more competitive. I think if you know the quarterback is getting the ball out, getting it where it needs to be, and again, you know, we didn't see a ton of that last week with Davis Warren, but I think he's capable. And it's got to be clean. It's got to be mistake-free football. But you know, I, I saw a team that had a, maybe a few more cracks than you would think for a group that came out and won 52-0 in week one. Now they're extremely fast. They're extremely athletic. Their linebackers are going to fit the run extremely well the anthony hills is a superstar uh, and uh, barden the safety they have on the back end is going to make things really difficult for michigan to kind of take some of those deep shots but there is a recipe here um unfortunately i can't confidently say if michigan can crack the code because of all the, the things we saw on tape last week so you know again it's it's this is an identity game for michigan if you can move the ball on the ground if you can kind of attack the death by pa a thousand paper cuts approach you're going to be in this game till the fourth quarter and, and maybe have a chance to win. For as much as Michigan's going to try to, and, and really always does this style of football, protect their quarterback, make things a little bit easier on them. Davis Warren is going to have to turn the page from page one to page two. He's going to have to make some plays himself in this offense against what is a pretty good Texas defense. I, I mean, the watching them, and Chris and I were coincidentally at Texas versus BYU last year. I wasn't scouting, believe me. Um, but wait a minute, wait a minute. There is video out there that indicates otherwise. I did have my iPhone. I was filming. My arm got really tired. I was filming the entire game, but that was just for myself to rewatch <laughs> it later. Um, but no, it was on Michigan's bye week. It was a great time. And I just remember seeing Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy and being like, holy wow, like those dudes can play. Obviously, they were huge, big time draft picks and then watching texas versus colorado state they you know the d-line didn't stand out as much they have a lot of depth on the the edge rusher spots the d tackles are a question mark the linebackers are fantastic um and the corners and safeties look at least better against colorado state than they did last season that was kind of their big downfall they allowed 430 passing yards to michael Penix in washington they lose by seven in the sugar bowl and would have had it, you know, would have played Michigan in the national championship game had they been able to stop the pass a little bit better. But Davis Warren is going to have to, uh, you know, be put in some better spots by the Michigan run game. They were off schedule too much last week. They had four times where it was third and nine or longer. They went over four on those opportunities. They averaged seven and a half yards to go on third down. That's got to be lower this week. So he can make some of those shorter throws. If they're not going to go deep with him, and this receiving core, uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll take a couple shots, but if they want to keep it a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage, then you have to have the sticks a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage. And, you know, that's on the run game. But, yeah, I think Kalel Mullings, uh, Kalel Mullings and Donovan Edwards could certainly do some damage, uh, you know, on the interior here in this game. Uh, but that's going to be the most fascinating thing is what can Davis Warren give you in this big game 
And can the Michigan O-line and run game take over in yet another big game? I was reading a great article over on InsideTexas.com, the On3 Texas site earlier. It said, you know, Texas can't fall for this Michigan trap. And it laid out basically the entire plot of this game where touchdown favorite, great passing attack comes in. I said, no, this is we're talking about Michigan, Ohio State the last three years, not Michigan, Texas, but it is really similar. And Michigan's been able to control the line of scrimmage in all those games, win them all. So it, it feels like a similar spot here. Uh, but can Michigan do it with a whole new group of personnel is a big question for me. That's the biggest question is what's the offense going to do against these guys, against the speed. But I'm, I'm glad that they played a solid opponent in week one, a, a good opponent. Yeah. I'll call him a good opponent because there's no fool's gold out there, right? It's not like going against a bunch of chumps from Bowling Green with all due respect. I said with all due respect, so I can say whatever I want. So uh, and and thinking that you're all that, they know they know they have some things to shore up, and they know that this opponent's going to be outstanding. It's a little early than they usually get them on the schedule, if we're being honest. So that to me is the key: the how the tackles hold up. Uh, Evan Link and Miles Hinton in pass pro. I think is going to be huge. Getting, uh, getting the kids some Davis Warren some some confidence early on in the game, and as Doug Skeen, my podcast partner, says, former offensive lineman, the best way to ruin a kid's confidence is by letting him get hit. So they got to keep him clean. Got to come out with some uh, creative play calling early and establish a little bit of the running game. Uh, you know, if that means, man, I would imagine Donovan Edwards is going to get the nod, right? If it were me, I'd have them both on the field at the same time with the first snap and, and keep them guessing, but uh, that they've got to get something going there. You cannot be in second and third and long early on in this game and get to where you want to be. In my opinion. Oh, I, I totally, I totally agree. And it, it's like I said, I feel, it feels like a Kalal Mullings game, but they got to be a little more creative with Donovan Edwards. You want to get him the ball with green grass in front of him because he's made a lot of plays in games like this that kind of flip momentum and, it seems like every time you're ready to be out on him, then the Penn State game from last year happens. Um, the Washington game from last year happens. So, again, you know, put your offense in in good positions to make plays. I, I mean, this is – it's almost – you know, again, the game is on the offensive line, and it's on the quarterback. But, you know, again, if, if Kurt Campbell and Sharon Moore can kind of dial something up to kind of – again, maybe the, the pre-snap motions, the – you want to get those fast linebackers, you know, even if you slow them up for just a second, you might open some space up for someone in the passing game. So, yeah, I mean, the chess match and the matchups everywhere are, are incredible in this game. A lot of intrigue. I love the juxtaposition of having, you know, Quinn Ewers, who we've, we've heard about as a five-star guy, probably since he was, what, 13 years old with a mullet. Um, yeah. and, and now it's <laughs> – they got two five-star guys there with Arch Manning there too. And, you know, Davis Warren, former walk-on, obviously we know his story at this point, just goes to work, earns the job. College football is weird, and and I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, the nation kind of is talking about Davis Warren after Saturday, hopefully in a good way. I, love, I really hope so. That kid deserves it. Could you imagine the the list of people trying to get in touch with Davis Warren next week if he wins this game and his media list? Uh, he'll have to uh, really have a tight schedule. That would be – Absolutely incredible. I'm sure we'll see a lot of him as well on some of the pregame shows this weekend on Saturday because everybody's going to be in town. ESPN's College Game Day, Fox Big Noon Kickoff, Barstool Sports College Football Show. Uh, so I'm sure they'll they'll kind of roll out that story because it is an incredible one. Uh, and uh, yeah, for Michigan's sake, you hope that uh, Davis Warren gets the job done. Uh, let's get to our predictions for this game, offensive player of the game, defensive player of the game, our X factors and our final scores. But before we do, we got to talk about our friends over at Game Time. Game Time is the exclusive ticketing partner of the Wolverine podcast. It's the easiest way to get tickets to the biggest games, concerts, or shows. The app is super easy to use. You go to GameTime, uh, GameTime.co or the Game Time app. My favorite part of the app is you go to it, you look at your seats. Um, you know, potential seats you want to buy, you get a photo of what the view looks like from that seat. Because one of the worst things is not knowing exactly what the sight line is going to be. If you're going to a new stadium for the first time, whatever, you see it right there on the screen. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, that is super helpful. They have the lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, job loss protection, and more. Um, my brother bought tickets for the game this weekend using game time. 
and he used the promo code on three for $20 off his first purchase. You can do the same thing. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time, download the game time app, create an account, use the code on three for $20 off your first purchase. That's uh, O N the numeral three terms apply again, create the account, redeem the code on three for $20 off terms apply downtime, uh, download game time today. What time is it? It's game time, baby. It's game time. It's almost game time. And, uh, we will make our predictions for Michigan's game. 12-10 is the official kickoff time on Saturday. I think Michigan, seven and a half point dog as we're talking right now, over under at 43 and a half. But before we uh, get to our scores, who's going to be the offensive player of the game for the Wolverines? I'm going with Mullings. I think he's going to run well. I think he's going to have a big game. I think this is the kind of game where you need a big physical bruising running back. So in the fourth quarter, you're wearing them down. If the game goes the way that Michigan wants it to, this is going to be a back-and-forth affair, low-scoring game where they take time off the clock. He's going to be the key to that, in my opinion. To me, he's the obvious choice. I'm putting this game on Mr. Jukebox himself. Samaj Morgan, a little quiet last week. I think Michigan's going to have to be a lot more creative with what it does offensively. And what better way than a guy that can do it all? You know, He can run the jet sweeps. He can be a weapon over the middle of the field. I've seen this guy track, you know, we saw him track the ball down the field last year on a back shoulder throw. I think the world of him, I think that his position group left a lot on the field last week and he's going to be the guy that leads the way. I'm with Chris. It's Kalel Mullings for me, but uh, we'll, we'll give uh, Samaj a mention in just a second. Defensive player of the game. I'll start this one out. I got Josiah Stewart. Um, Big time, big time matchup. We should have mentioned it earlier with, uh, their, their tackles, very, very good, especially left tackle Kelvin Banks Jr. He's a projected first-round draft pick, uh, 6'4", I think 320. Uh, but Josiah Stewart was maybe the best player on the field on Saturday night last week, in my opinion. And uh, maybe Dominic Zavada had something to say about that. But uh, it's going to be huge to make Quinn Ewers uncomfortable get to the quarterback. I'm going with Will Johnson. If they're going to shut this passing attack down, it's going to have to be Will. He's going to have to play better than he did last week. He took a few risks and got caught napping a couple times, if we're being honest. And they picked on him a little bit before his pick six. So I think he rebounds with a big game. I think Will Johnson is going to be one of the keys to shutting down this Texas offense, if not the key. I am going to go with Jay Sean Barham. Uh, he's a guy that we we spotlighted last week. I certainly think you saw him flash his athleticism, his playmaking ability in week one. Um, so much of this, you know, Sark's offense is, is built on deception and getting those guys to kind of freeze up and, and you open up an opportunity for someone else or someone to make a play. Jay Sean Barham and Ernest Hausman, I think kind of co, co-guys as the, the biggest keys of this game on defense for me. Yeah, Barham was everywhere. Uh, they, they blitzed him 13 times on Saturday, so he'll be flying around. Uh, my X factor for this game is Samaj Morgan. Anthony, your pick for offensive player of the game. Sharon said on Monday night on his radio show, he wants to get him more involved, get him more touches along with Tyler Morris. Samaj Morgan, you can get him the football in a lot of different ways. So I think he could change the game for Michigan on offense. Last year, a few times, they were kind of stuck in the mud offensively. Next thing you know, he's running around the end for a touchdown. So Samaj could be a game changer. I think Tyler Morris, I think he is the guy that has to step up. He is the, the essentially the veteran of that that wide receiver crew and it's his turn. So he was a top hundred kid for a reason. He's better than he showed. He's going to have to have a much bigger game and, and do some more. And if the ball's thrown to him, he's got to catch it. He's got to track it. He's got to catch it, which he did not do on that beautifully thrown ball from Davis Warren last week. Weird to say is the next factor, but I got to do it. It's a big game. Donovan Edwards shows up in big games. Uh, I, I think that they're going to make an effort to get him more involved this week uh and offensive line a big part of that but the don will show up this week you heard it back on question mark that's you know that's in the past that's andrew (laughs) anthony's cross to bear we don't we don't talk about that (laughs) oh that's fair Um, (laughs) our (laughs) final scores for this game i got michigan falling for the first time in a long time since the the year of our lord 2022 uh, but I do have Texas winning 28 to 17. You got four touchdowns, no field goals. You don't think they're going to hold them out of the end zone at all? I think they'll hold them out of the end zone. 
Yeah, I mean, but down in the red zone, I think that's going to be one of the keys to this game, and that's why I've got Texas 26-20. to 20. I think Michigan's going to hold them to some field goals in this game, but I still think they're going to score a few times, and it's going to be fascinating to see how Wink Martindale plays this. Uh, I just don't think Michigan has enough offense here, and I do think that Texas is going to get enough points to, to get where they need to get, sadly. Yeah, I've been saying it all summer. I think Michigan and Texas will play a rock fight. I still think that's going to be the case. Um, I picked Michigan to go 10-2 and two because I thought they would beat Texas. And I'm not uh, I'm not ready to say that right now. Uh, I don't think, like you guys have said, I just don't know that there's enough offensive firepower. Um, I'm really hoping we don't come out of this game feeling like, you know, it's, it's a 2017 type of thing where, gosh, you were right there, but um, you just didn't get enough plays from the quarterback position. I have Texas winning this game 20 to 16. I think it could come down to kicks. And if it does come down to kicks, you got to feel good about what you have if you're Michigan, right? Uh, but again, I just I just think in games where it is even like this, I mean, it's just hard to pick against, you know, the known commodity at quarterback versus whatever's going on with Michigan right now. I almost picked Dominic Zavada as my Z factor, not an X factor, but a, Z factor, but I didn't do it. But we have some uh, incredible names. Uh, apparently, when Dominic Zavada makes a kick in practice, the entire team, they're just yelling his last name because it's fun to say. And then Texas is bringing in their kicker, Burt Auburn, which yeah. is also an incredible name. Burt Auburn. He was 29 and 35 last year, made from 54. So he's got a big leg as well. So if it comes on to kicks... First, whatever Auburn. kicker can handle the pressure better. Love it. Sounds like a 60s songwriter. <laughs> it does. It does. It's that's, a, that's, a, that's a Texas pit master name if I've ever heard one. <laughs> that's fantastic. I think yeah, he served us at Pinkerton's at Houston, Chris. Probably. Probably. <laughs> so, Bert Auburn against Dominic Zavada if it comes down to kicks. But uh, let's move into our final segment. No man knows the future. And I was looking at the schedule for this weekend's games, and I was kind of like, okay, where are the – where are these huge games? I'm like, oh, that's right. Michigan is a part of one of those this weekend. Michigan and Texas, kind of the epicenter of the college football world this weekend. few solid ones uh, will stay in the Big Ten for all three that will pick Iowa State at Iowa starts us off. Iowa, two and a half point favorite over under a whopping 35 and a half, even though Iowa scored 40 points last week. Um, AB, go ahead. You go first. We'll do a little rotation. I'm going to go with Iowa in this game. Uh, everyone's favorite godson, Matt Campbell, uh, has shown his ass to the world since the COVID season where everyone said he should replace Jim Harbaugh. So I don't trust him. Uh, go Hawks. I think Iowa State's do. And I think that they're going to find a way to pull this one out. It's going to be an ugly one. It's going to be something like 20 to 16. And now it's the over. I'm going to go with 17 to 13, uh, Iowa State over Iowa. Okay. Yeah, it's you don't want to take the over in this one, I don't no. think. Um, I'm a noted Matt Campbell hater. I do have Iowa State, though, in this game. I just don't trust the Iowa offense. I know that's not a hot take, uh, but I'm going to go with Iowa State. That one's 330 on CBS. Uh, Michigan State at Maryland. Early Big Ten game. Maryland, eight-and-a-half point favorite over under 43-and-a-half. Maryland routed UConn last week 50 to 7 Michigan State 16 to 10 over Florida Atlantic Dusty Mays old uh, old school there in East Lansing CB what do you got on this one uh I'm gonna go with Maryland something like uh, 30 to 17 I don't think Michigan State's worth a crap I think their defense has looked better than it probably is because they played an inept opponent so I think Maryland controls this game start to finish and uh, pulls out a 13 point victory yeah, I expected a little more offensively just because Jonathan Smith is an offensive mind. Aiden Childs, I think, still has a, a nice future, but that was rough last week. And going on the road week two, like it's a spot they kind of need to win. Big test for them. Uh, I can't pick them, though. I'm going with the Terps. They need to win or what? <laughs> Who? Michigan State? Yeah. Or they're on pace to being what we thought. Or else they're going three and nine this year. Like that's <laughs> just, yeah. Three and nine or four. <laughs> Or an eight. Um, no, no, we'll see. Aiden, Aiden Childs, I, I'm mad at Aiden Childs because he said take the over last week and it didn't hit. So um, weird comment, weird not to back it up. I got Maryland as well. Billy Edwards looked really good last week. I know it was against UConn, but 
there is life after uh, Talia leaves. So uh, Colorado at Nebraska is the last game we'll pick. Nebraska, seven and a half point favorite over under 58 and a half uh, game, 730 on NBC. So we will be able to watch that one. I do have a quote from a source in the state of Nebraska on this game. They said uh, Nebraska's out for blood for sure. They almost beat them last year with a completely incompetent quarterback. Rayola looked pretty solid, and I think the D-line will handle the O-line plus a home field advantage at night. It's theirs to lose for sure. That is from our producer, Megan, who gave me that information. I'm taking Nebraska. I love Nebraska in this game. I want – I'm a big Coach Prime guy, but I got Nebraska. I'm a big Megan guy when it comes to picking games, so I'm going to go with Megan, and I'm going with the Huskers. Uh, I think the Huskers will cover, uh, and that will just be fine with me because I'm really not a Coach Prime fan, uh, the way he runs things. I know that you are, Clay, but uh, I like my I like my coaches with class, my Sharon Moore guys. Look at me. I'm I'm head to toe in Detroit Lions gear. Do you think I'm going to pick against Dominic Riola's son in the biggest game of his life? No. Hell no. Huskers roll. You can double it. They'll win by 15 at least. Okay. Yeah, it should be an electric at- atmosphere. We've seen that at Nebraska. So excited for this weekend of college football. Excited for Michigan against Texas. You can follow all of our coverage over at thewolverine.com. Again, use the promo code GOBLUE, all one word, uh, to get in at the Wolverine.com, 50% off an annual subscription. Like the video if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, and we'll see everyone next time.